<laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about acne. And I joke and, 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 di and dermatology in general, because I'm sort of the derm guru in the office. And so when a resident pops in and says, can you look at a patient, I ask, where's the rash? Uh, especially senior residents. So let's talk about acne. It's one of the most common things you're gonna see in the office, chronic disease of the sebaceous unit, which begins at the onset of puberty. And so you can look at where are the sebaceous glands the most prominent, that's the face, chest, and back. Um, in, in part, you'll see inflammatory components, and when you see the red pimples, the pustules, the nodules, and the cysts, you can uh, intuit that uh, P. acne has been involved. That's a gram-positive organism, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the mechanism of that. A microcomedone to a pimple and healing takes roughly six to eight weeks to completely heal in its inflammatory process. And some of the other things that you want to advise are oil-free, fat-free, hypoallergenic, non-comeogenic makeup for people that are using those uh, uh, things on their skin. And soaps and detergents really have very little impact on acne, but you'll see the teenagers like to buff and polish and I like to call that the lace potato chip phenomena. If you take away the oil on the skin, what does the skin do? Makes more oil, increases your risk for micro and then macro plugging, which can lead down the inflammatory cascade. When we look at acne, we like to think of that in two sort of uh, subtypes, inflammatory and non-inflammatory acne. Non-inflammatory acne actually is the open and closed comedones and very minimal red pimples. If you see inflammatory acne, you're gonna see the red pimples, nodules, nodular cystic, cystic, and scarring acne, and that implies the action of P. acne. So here's a question for you. Uh, acne vulgaris treatment is isotretoin, excellent choice. Use of topical antibiotics is not indicated because of poor efficacy. Ethanol, estradiol, norgestimate, and spironolactone can be useful as systemic agents or benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid are available, but only work if you use in prescription strength. So what do you think? Answer is, you're all not awake, I know. Another cup of coffee, answer is C. We'll talk about that. So recommendations, if you have mainly comedomal acne with an occasional inflamed or very minimal red pimples, we'll consider topical retinoic acid or retinoid derivatives, benzoyl peroxide or azelatic acid. Those are keratolytics. If you will, they unplug the uh, micro-plugging that has begun to give you that comedone open or closed. If you start having pustules and more red pimples, that implies P. acne, and you want to use a topical antibiotic plus benzoyl peroxide or a retinoid. Um, and if they get worse or if they're now involving the chest and the back, in which case the skin is thicker um, in terms of the stratum corneum, you want to then use our add-on consideration for an oral antibiotic as well as topical antibiotic and topical retinoid derivatives. And for women, you can use um, modulation of the hormonal system with an OCP that's low in androgenic activity. If you start getting into the scarring cyst or nodular cystic acne, then you can use the systemic antibiotics or consider um, either referring for or prescribing Accutane. And when you prescribe Accutane, it does require you to participate in the I Pledge program. There's a lot of paperwork. You need to make sure that the woman has two forms of birth control on but about the month before and during the duration of the therapy, because again, Accutane or isotretoin is teratogenic. Um, and um, when you use this medication, because it's such a uh, sebostatic agent, you take all other medications away. It reduces sebum production by about 95%. So when we look at the uh, other topical retinoids, one of the things to also remember is tazeratic acid or tazerac is a category X and should not be used in, in women of childbearing age. Benzoyl peroxide is an interesting drug, and it's the drug most people use as first choice. Why? Because it's available over the counter in um, various strengths. It has both an antibiotic-like activity and a comeolytic activity, so it makes it a good first drug or an add-on drug. 
And then the topical antibiotics, again, eliminate the bacteria. Um, there are a lot of combination products available. So things like benzoyl plus clindamycin or erythromycin plus adaptin. The biggest problem I have with combinations is my uh, population that we take care of is a lot of Medicaid. And so they don't pay for combinations um, on the whole. Oral antibiotics, the tetracyclines in the past um, were used. Interestingly, not only were they an antibiotic, but they're also uh, mild oral anti-inflammatory. Um, and you, sometimes you will see a patient on tetracycline and you go, well, they don't have acne. Let's go use the anti-inflammatory effect. And I've seen some of our rheumatologists use that as well. That's not available as widely as it used to be. So we're using things like doxycycline, minocycline, um, you can use trimethoprim sulfa, you can use azithromax, but there's an increased risk of uh, antibiotic resistance and also the side effects. Um, and so we again look at those as topical agents. Now that's, that's acne in five minutes of which I can spend an hour on. So again, just remember we're hitting the highlights. Other rashes that you'll see commonly in the office, atopic dermatitis. Someone once referred to this as the itch that rashes. Um, you'll see this as often dry skin, um, often in younger individuals on the face and the antecubital fossa or the popliteal fossa. As the child matures, so does the rash. It can drift around to the extensor surfaces um, and it can show up with things like hyperkeratosis pilaris. We have these little plugging on the um, upper arms. Um, usually it's hydration in the skin, a low dose steroid if there's an inflammatory process. So things like triencimolone, 0.1%. Um, if they're really um, troubled or very crusty and scaled, you can use things like picrolimus or tacrolimus for unresponsive patients. It's an eruption that it's referred to as a lichenification eruption. And again, we talked about where it typically appears. Um, but you can see that sometimes the biggest problem is the itch rash, itch rash cycle, and you try to break that, you may need to use an antihistamine to treat the itching. Another thing we'll see in terms of a papular squamous rash, um, a scaling rash, crusting sometimes, it's erosis, some people call this uh, eczema. Um, again, the treatment is uh, aimed at the inflammatory component with a low potency steroid and good skin lubrication. This is the patient that you have to tell them using skin lubrication, not once a day, but four to six times a day. All right, this is another rash. Again, um, it has a scaly papulosquamous type rash, thickened white scale. And what's true with regard to this? Develops at sites of trauma, seen on the flexor uh, surfaces, treated with vincristin or associated with allergic component. Well, first you have to know what this is. It's the heartbreak of psoriasis, right? And so what is the only true statement there? It develops at sites of trauma. <clears throat> so this is psoriasis, again, plaque, um, scaly, white, adherent, that coalesces over time from smaller plaques into bigger plaques. If you pick at it and try to pick the scale off, it bleeds. That's known as Auschwitz sign. Um, and again, if you see it along lines of trauma, so the patient will say, I didn't have this plaque. I got scratched by a branch when I was out mowing the lawn, and now I have a psoriatic plaque. That's Nodler's phenomena. Ten typically, it's on the extensor surfaces. Uh, but again, like everything in medicine, it may not be. Um, and the differential here can be syphilis, eczema, or seborrhea, especially if it affects mostly the scalp. Um, arthritis can develop, so you can have the seronegative spondyloarthropathy associated with psoriatic arthritis. And the treatments are very depends on the extent of the disease. So you can use topical steroids. You can use um, sorolin A and UV light, known as PUVA therapy. You can use vitamin D derivatives. Um, or you can use methyltrexate um, if it's extensive disease. And if it's very extensive, you can use the tumor necrosis factors as well. So just like we did that in some of our um, rheumatoid diseases, you can use methyltrexate and the TNF uh, factors as well. Now, if you look at this and to see that just this, the scale here isn't quite as white or silvery. It's more of a yellow, greasy colored scale. This is seborrheic dermatitis. 
And seborrheic dermatitis, again, we think there's some hormonal components to this. There's some genetic components. Um, and there's also um, felt to be a fungal overlay because if you culture some of these, you'll get the typical fungus Malassezia furfur. Um, the presentation in infants, we call it cradle cap. In adults, we call it seborrheic dermatitis because who wants to have uh, a 50-year-old and tell them they have cradle cap, right? Um, it can also appear on the eyebrows, the nasal labial folds, and into the beard area. And it's an interesting presentation. If you see somebody that presents with florid seborrheic dermatitis, think of either nutritional problems or it is another manifestation of HIV disease. Um, so it's a topical manifestation of an internal problem. The treatment here, again, if it's a lot of uh, irritation, you can use low-potency steroids. You can use things like Protopic or Elidil. You can use keratolytics like salicylic acid. You can also use an antifungal shampoo like Nizoril um, or Selsin Blue. You put it on two or three times a week. You leave it on for five to ten minutes. You wash it off. In kids who have a really thick crusting form of this, you can also defat the um, seborrhea with Dawn dishwashing soap. It's a little pearl. <clears throat> All right, still in the papula squamous unit, you see this, um, and it, you see this um, reddish rash, and the patient may or may not come in complaining of a lot of itching. A lot of times they have a combination of itching and they want to know what's the rash. How many of you guys use dermoscopy? Anybody know what a dermoscope is, right? It's a magnification, 10x polarized light lets us look actually into the, epi, into the epidermis, into the dermis. And a lot of times, if you'll see um, on the one picture that's got that football shape, there's a little fine cholerate scale. It's very thin, almost papyrus-like. That is sort of um, a hallmark of pityriasis rosea. Um, and it's a self-limited eruption. A lot of times they have one rash that starts about a week to 10 days before, then the whole rash announces itself, referred to as the hurled patch. A lot of patients don't pay attention to that, or they think it may have been a topical fungal infection. They tried a little bit of an aminazole derivative, like clotrimazole or monostat over the counter, or they don't see it at all because it's on their back or shoulder. We describe them as Christmas tree type pattern because they line up along the skin axis lines. And the treatment here is recognition that this is a self-limited disease and we can use antihistamines for itching. Some people use a little topical steroid if it's a significant pyritic lesion. The interesting thing is in, a, in adults, the average course is four to six weeks. In African-Americans, it's much shorter. It's two to three weeks. We don't know why. All right, so switching out of the papular squamous to more the red inflammatory, if you look at this woman's face, yeah, this is a butterfly rash. It is, however, not lupus. It's hot, it's warm, it's rapidly spreading. There's definite demarcation between normal and abnormal skin. If you look at that, there's swelling, there's edema, um, a sort of a taunt area. This is um, a staph A infection known as erysipelas. Um, treatment here is a penicillin derivative, doxycycline, erythromycin, but the, the thing here is there's well-demarcated borders between the normal and abnormal involved skin. So you also can see this is a palpable rash, um, or it can be palpable, and petechia and purpura are not necessarily a, a one disease state, but they may be caused by a multitude of factors, including antibiotics. Um, and so uh, if you can identify the causative agent, you remove it. The treatment then for is usually it resolves over time. The difference between petechia and purpura are just based on size, with petechia being less than three millimeters, purpura being more. You can see this also as an inflammatory component with some of your infections or in vasculitis. One of the more common purpuras that we see, especially in older children is henoch Scholein purpura. Lower extremities, usually from buttocks down, they can coalesce. They can look, look a lot like contusions or bruises, and so sometimes the differential is this kid being abused. But it's, it's an interesting um, uh, uh, purpura because it is not related to low platelet count. It's an autoimmune phenomena, 
Um, again, usually IgA mediated, um, usually self-limited, but occasionally involves the renal system. So you may need um, nephrology consultation um, and they may need oral steroids, but usually self-limiting. Another rash on the lower extremities, which this is sort of violaceous and taut skin, tender over the anterior shins. This is erythema nodosum. It's a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, um, usually caused by infection. So you're talking strep, post-strep, TB, um, and or associated with sarcoidosis. So if you see this on the extremities, you might look at, is there any lung involvement? There may be an association. And then half the time we have no idea why it causes it. But the more common in women, um, you can see post, I'm sorry, pre-arthralgia. So as that um, delayed hypersensitivity reaction is kicking in, they may have myalgias and arthralgias. The treatment here is usually an anti-inflammatory um, and you can use potassium iodide. The doses is there that may help resolve this. Um, the big differential here, and I've had this happen on a number of occasions, is when you see it on a unilateral shin, the, the differential here is, is this MRSA. And I've had patients that have been biopsied, and it comes back as um, erythema nodosum, and it has no treatment, obviously, from antibiotics. In fact, they could have been caused by that. This is another rash, again, sort of spreading, raised borders, itchy, pyritic, hives, wheels, um, diffuse rash. 80% of the time, if you have somebody with chronic urticaria, you're not going to come up with the answer. That's a real differential uh, nightmare. Um, usually IgE mediated, self-limited, unless it recurs. Um, treatment with antihistamines. You can use the H1 blockers as well because they have H2-like property. Um, I'm sorry, you can use the H2 that have H1 property. If you have angioedema, you have urticaria, but it's into the dermis, and you can see some familial cause of that or associated with your ACE inhibitors, in which case um, you need to work them up for a C1 esterase deficiency. Now, this is a drug eruption. And again, how do I know that? One is I can take the history, but this is not regular. There's irregular. There's some necrosis of the skin, if you see that on the anterior knee. Um, and again, um, asymmetric rash. Um, you can see it in a spectrum with erythema multiforme and urticaria and serum sickness. Although if you look at some of the new literature, E. multiforme is now considered its own entity and it's not on the same spectrum as things like serum sickness, urticaria, and um, even drug fever. The complication with urticaria or a drug eruption can be seen with involvement of the mucosa membranes, and then we call it the Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And why do we care? Because it has a 10% mortality or lethality in especially the older or the very young. The treatment, if it's if an offending agent, you remove it. You can use oral or topical steroids and antihistamines for itching. Here's E. multiforme, which is now felt to be its own entity, um, separate from the, the related just to the drug. It's still a hypersensitivity reaction. And as I said, the severe form is this is actually toxic echodermal necrolysis, where you're sloughing greater than 30% of your skin surface area. And you can imagine the problems with that. We'll show you a 10 in just a second. The, the sine qua non of this are target lesions or bullseye lesions on the hands and the feet. And again, most of our rashes spare the hands and feet with things like secondary syphilis being one of the exceptions. Um, here, if you have an offending agent, remove it, and you can do a steroid burst, 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisone equivalents um, for seven to 10 days, and usually these will resolve. This is Stephen Johnson's. If you see that um, skin, is, there's edema. Um, it's got the peau de orange or orange peel type characteristics characterization to the skin and you see the mucous membrane looks like it's weeping and it is so they can have bullous forms of this as well and these patients can be quite sick this is 10 you see you're sloughing greater than 30 percent of your body surface area their major challenge with 10 is it often gets treated in the burn unit because you can imagine just like burns where you have significant surface area loss, they have problems with fluid electrolyte and secondary infections. So you, the problem here is toxic uh, 
ectodermal necrolysis is just that, 50% mortality in the elderly individual. It also has a, what's called Nikolsky sign. If I take my thumb and I slide it along the skin, I will slough off the epidermis from the dermis. Um, it is not pathognomonic for 10, but it certainly does give you a pause to, to try and be careful in treating and rolling these patients because they literally will slough their skin. The treatment for 10 is really good fluid hydration. If they get a secondary infection, you're treating it appropriately. Um, some people argue about steroids and IVIG. It's controversial. All right, so let's talk a little bit about a couple of our blistering lesions, pemphigus vulgaris and bullus pemphigoid, pemphigus-like. Um, they're rare and, and can be lethal in about 10% of patients, usually seen in the older individual. Um, it's an autoimmune phenomena, and if you're going to try and diagnose whether it's pemphigus vulgaris or bullous pemphigoid, you need a punch biopsy and you need immunochemical staining. You're looking there at direct immunofluorescence at the activity and where it's layered out in the, either the basement membrane or intracellular helps us in determining whether it's bullous pemphigoid or pemphigus vulgaris. Um, it also has Nikolsky sign, so you can slough the skin off the epidermis. The treatment here is, depending on um, what you're treating, it may be IV steroids or oral steroids. If you're looking at pemphigus vulgaris, it's IgG autoantibodies, and they are actually destroying the adhesion molecules or the desmoglins in the, in the epidermis and the dermal layer. If you look at bullous pemphigoid, again, a blistering lesion, but it's not just IgG, it's IgA, IgE, um, and you'll see linear deposition of the complement, so they'll have a lower complement level, and they develop antibodies to the basement membrane. The treatment is, again, steroids, sulfones, immunosuppressive medicines. Now, how common is this? Well, I've been around 35 years in medicine. I have one bullous pemphigoid and one pemphigus vulgaris. And the bullous pemphigoid was the easy diagnosis because it was a 95-year-old, came into my urgent care but I was, when I was working urgent care, and, she, and the complaint on the chart said, bullous pemphigoid said, well, that's really interesting at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I asked her, why are you here? And she said, because her dermatologist told her when she got a flare, she should go to MedExpress and be treated. And then I asked her, what would you like to be treated with? And she said, oh, he always gives me steroids. I said, this is great. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. The patient told me the diagnosis. She told me the therapy. What I got out of it was a picture. And that, so I saved that in my files. Couple other diseases which we don't see as much, but we're seeing resurgence of. Varicella, again, a very infectious agent. If you want to um, create more business, bring them in at nine o'clock in the morning, have them sit in your pediatric waiting room, right? Usually don't try to bring them in at all. If they tell you they've got you know, red spots, cru uh, blisters and crusts, they're all three at the same time, it's varicella. Um, and so, again, we don't see it as common, but we, we do see it in people that are not immunizing or um, that have never been immunized, and they can get complications of encephalitis and pneumonia. You can see this, again, we don't see it as much, but I do a fair amount of missions work. I still see this when I go down to Guatemala. We did see it in Peru. Um, and so the treatment here is, if you identify it, you can give um, immune globulin, varizig, and begin the immunization. You can also, if it's within the first 72 hours, use your antivirals like acyclovir or valcyclovir. Doesn't make the rash go away, but decreases the length of the rash. And you do want to avoid salicylates. This is what we're really trying to avoid with our vaccinations and the, sh and the chicken pox. But this is the shingles, again, varicella virus. Um, Pre-eruptive burning or itching, sometimes exquisite pain. I've seen it mimic kidney stones as it comes around in the dermatomal distribution. Um, the complications are post-herpetic neuralgia, chronic pain for up to two years, and you can get scarring. Um, the treatment, antivirals, again, in the first 72 hours, um, and using our vaccine, the Shingrix, uh, is probably now preferred over the old Zostervax.
Herpes simplex, another common, uh, if you will, viral rash. Type 1 in the mouth predominantly, like 2 in the genitalia. Obviously, there's a crossover. I will leave you to your imagination as how that happens. This, however, is vagus, right? Um, and the complications that we worry about are spread to neo, to, um, during delivery um, with the torch syndromes or neonatal infections. Usually they're self-limited, but sometimes they're uncomfortable. We'll treat them with our oral uh, antiviral agents. And we do have to be careful with the topical acyclovir. There is now developed some resistance. So a lot of people are switching to the orals. Interestingly, the oral is also cheaper than the topical. Go figure. All right, a couple other viruses that we see. Um, hand, foot, and mouth disease tends to be seen in outbreaks. It's a Coxsackie A16 virus um, where you'll see vesicles on the hands, the foot, and the mouth. It is really nice when the patient comes in and you can look at that and say, hand, foot, mouth. Aha, uh -huh, I got the diagnosis. Actually, the patients now come in and say, doc, I think I have hand, foot, and mouth disease. And they're usually right. The, the oral lesions are really not all that descriptive. They're referred to as aptus-like, but the, the blisters, if you on the hand, are kind of rhomboidal. Um, it is oral fecal, and it can go through daycare centers rapidly. Actually, one of my call group partners just had to cancel the cruise because her son came down with hand, foot, and mouth, and then her husband came down with hand, foot, and mouth. So they'll be rescheduling. This is your rhomboidal blistering, and you see that on the lip is just kind of nondescript, atlas-like. Um, so uh, you can usually make this diagnosis clinically. Now, if, if this is the worst named thing in the world, it's not herpes, and it's not angina, but we call it herpangina. I like to think of it as hand, foot, and mouth without the hand and the feet because it's just mouth. It's still Coxsackie virus, usually seen in, in kids where they come in with a fever, drooling, they don't want to swallow, they don't want to eat. Um, you'll see these ulcerative lesions on the soft palate, um, Coxsackie virus. Treatment is really symptomatic. One little hint that helps sometimes on pediatric patients, a little bit of Maalox mixed one-to-one -one with topical um, uh, Benadryl suspension acts sort of like a topical anesthetic. In adults, we can add lidocaine if we want, but we have to be careful because you can get lidocaine toxicity and seizures. And with that, uh, I am done dermatology part one. <laughs>